with the gift of thoughtful conversation this holiday season with a membership to the Commonwealth Club. And good morning to those on the West Coast and good afternoon to, the, afternoon to those on the East where I am. My name is Jessica Denson. I'm the Director of Communications for Connected Nation, a nonprofit organization committed to finding innovative solutions for expanding access, adoption, and use of high-speed internet and its related technologies across the country. I'm also a former broadcast journalist, so I'm pleased to be the moderator of, for this critical conversation on closing the digital divide in California and the Bay Area where our speakers today are from. We'll also examine how some of the practices we talk about today can be applied in other states. A special thank you goes to AT&T for its support of, its pro of this program, enabling us to, act to make this act accessible from anywhere in the nation. I am joined today by two leaders in the effort to close the digital divide. Evan Marwell, the founder and CEO of Education Superhighway, one of the nation's leading nonprofit organizations focused on the digital divide, especially when it comes to helping improve connectivity on the home front. And Lorena Chavez, who wears several hats in the Bay Area when she is not working on school and community partnerships for Teach for America, she is leading efforts with the Digital Equity Coalition, a group of elected officials and educators working to bridge the digital divide. She is also a trustee for the East Side Union High School District in East San Jose, where she is from. Before we jump into the conversation, I wanted to set the stage a little. For decades now, groups and individuals have worked toward closing the digital divide. Often the conversation centered around getting schools and other public institutions connected with little to no focus on the need to improve connectivity within the home. I would argue that was simply because many lawmakers and decision makers did not understand what was at stake. But the pandemic in many ways changed the conversation on internet access and the digital divide, making clear how much more needs to be done on this issue and that at home internet connectivity is not just a luxury or privilege for the few, but it is critical for accessing education, the economy, telehealth, government services, and so much more. Of course, one of the most powerful visuals of the past two years came from the picture of two girls accessing high-speed internet from a Taco Bell in California, not in their homes. With many schools closed for in-person instruction, home access was a necessity for our children, and of course, for citizens of all ages looking to access healthcare and government services. A clear picture of what the digital divide truly is and its negative impact began to emerge. It wasn't just a problem for a few nonprofits or individuals. All of us could now see that not every student or person lives in a home with high-speed internet access, either because of affordability or availability. And that was hurting American families and communities. Thankfully, as a result, the federal government in, recent, in the recent infrastructure bill and state governments like California have directed funding to close the divides that still exist. But I would say, and I think some of the, our guests today would agree with me that we know it's not enough. And that is why we are here today to discuss finally closing the digital divide once and for all. One important housekeeping tip that I've been asked to share, if you have a question for either Evan, Lorena or myself, Please put it in the Zoom chat. Questions posted there will be forwarded to me throughout the program, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. So let's jump in after that long introduction. Evan, I'm going to start with you, um, because the story of your organization, Education Superhighway, in many ways tells the story of the digital divide over the past year. Can you give viewers an overview of your organization's mission now and how it has shifted over the past several years? Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Great to be here. Uh, thanks to the Commonwealth Club for having me. Um, so Education Superhighway is a nonprofit that I started back in 2012. Our original mission was to close the digital divide in America's K-12 classrooms. 
when we started back in 2012, only 10% of schools actually had broadband that was good enough for students and teachers to use technology for digital learning in their classrooms. We then spent the next seven years till 2019 connecting over 99% of America's classrooms. And, and along the way, we learned a lot about what some of the barriers were and who the critical partners were in, in the effort to close the digital divide. We actually finished our original mission uh, in 2019, and we were scheduled to sunset the organization in 2020, uh, having done that. But then, of course, the pandemic hit and changed not just our plans, but pretty much everybody in the world's plans. And um, we decided to uh, stick around because there was a new problem. When we sent 50 million kids home, uh, it turned out that 15 million of them didn't have internet access at home, and, you know, like those two girls sitting outside the Taco Bell. And um, so we started getting calls from, you know, governor's offices around the country and school districts, policymakers in D.C. saying, you know, what do we do? Like, how do we figure out which of these kids are not connected and, and what do we do to actually connect them so that they can participate in remote schooling? Um, over the course of uh, the rest of 2020, we uh, helped connect about 3 million kids to, to broadband so that they could attend school. And in the process, we, we realized that the pandemic was creating, as you said, this, in, this real change in the attitudes of mm -hmm. the nation towards the digital divide. And um, as a result of that, We've seen uh, the federal government now put up $85 billion um, to fund closing the digital divide at home. Uh, we've seen affordability uh, become a primary part of the discussion about the digital divide, whereas historically it has always been simply about building infrastructure to rural America where there was none. And, um, and we think that, there, that we're really at a turning point. And so as a result, we, uh, about a month ago, decided to relaunch a new mission for Education Superhighway focused on closing the digital divide for the 18 million households in America that actually have access to the internet. There's infrastructure in their neighborhood or at their front door, um, but can't, uh, can't get online because they can't afford to connect. Um, what's interesting is that those 18 million households, which is almost 50 million people, um, they represent two thirds of the digital divide. Only a third of the digital divide is now in rural America, is, is in building infrastructure to rural America. And by the way, even once we build that infrastructure, a lot of those people are going to suffer from the same thing that we call the broadband affordability gap. So. Our mission today is, is focused on the affordability piece of the digital divide. Um, our work is very similar to the work we did last time. It's, it's making sure that there's awareness of the problem. Uh, it's working to collect the data we need to identify uh, which households do and don't have internet. Um, and we've got a great partnership with, uh, with over 130 ISPs to do that. Um, and then it's, uh, it's working on policy at the federal level. Thank you for the infrastructure bill, that's amazing. Uh, but now we have to work at the state and local level. And then it's working to actually get people connected. And so uh, we're doing things like putting free Wi-Fi networks, in low, low income apartment buildings and helping uh, Americans across the country um, apply for and get signed up for the affordable connectivity uh, broadband subsidy program that the federal government now has as well as getting them signed up for affordable broadband plans from, from ISPs in their neighborhoods. So there's a lot going on. Um, you know, it took us seven years to close the digital divide in America's classrooms. With the new energy behind this, I, I don't see why we couldn't close the digital divide in America's homes over the next seven years. I would, I would applaud that and agree. Um, I think it's important to point out that the uh, infrastructure bill had $65 billion in it for broadband and $14.2 billion of that go to the, the program that you mentioned, which is the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, which is changing to the Affordable Connectivity Program in the next year. But that's to make that permanent. Um, Lorena, in, in my introduction, let's, I want to turn to you now. I spoke about how the pandemic shifted our understanding of the digital divide, and, and Evan also spoke about that a little bit uh, what have you seen in and around San Jose and the Silicon Valley of all places over the past 20 months as it relates to this issue? And, and why did you help start the Digital Equity Coalition? 
Yeah. Thank you. First of all, thank you for, for having me on today. It really is a pleasure to be able to speak to our broader community about this important issue of inequity with uh, digital access for our communities, especially our highest needs communities in Silicon Valley. Right. You hear Silicon Valley and you think, oh, wow, they're fully connected, high tech companies. Mm -hmm. And then you realize that we have some of the starkest disparities in our communities, which is very problematic, to say the least. Um, So the digital divide is, is not new. It's just been amplified to another degree with this pandemic. Right. This global pandemic has surfaced longstanding issues of inequitable Internet and Wi-Fi access. Right. It's dramatically limiting the ability still to this day of our youth to fully participate and engage in class in education for our parents to work from home, for our families to have access to telehealth medicine. Right. Um, And so now with with the global pandemic, most of our lives, a lot of our lives have moved to um, virtual, a virtual aspect of it. Right. We have education, we have employment, um, telemedicine, social connectivity. It's how we engage a lot more with people. Um, and so uh, a group of fellow trustees and myself across the Bay Area decided to form the Digital Equity Coalition. Um, so we're, we're a group of elected officials who um, said enough is enough. Right. There is enough disparities in education. And if we don't support our students and families to at least have Internet access, it's not even having a seat in the classroom. Right. This is baseline for us. Um, And so we launched this um, this effort and it's two two pronged approach, um, two focuses that we have. Um, One of them is short term emergency solutions, which is hotspots, connectivity devices, laptops, Chromebooks, funding for data plans. Um, And that was the initial focus once the pandemic hit, because everybody was scrambling to figure out what do we do? What is happening? Um, And now we're we're more focused on our our second part um, of our vision of our mission, which is long term infrastructure development. So in partnership with government entities, we're addressing digital equity by supporting uh, permanent broadband infrastructure for low income residents predominantly, right? Um, And so we've been doing a lot of work specifically with the County of Santa Clara and the city of San Jose. And this group, the Digital Equity Coalition has been very instrumental in getting $7.1 million in funding from Santa Clara and about 3 million um, from the city of San Jose. So in total, we've been able to, to get about 10 million for internet access, but this is just the beginning for us. Um, so that's a little bit about the work and um, that we've been doing. Um, if I may stick with you for just one moment, um, yeah. the Digital Equity Coalition, you said it was made up of elected officials. I have found in my discussions as a director of communications for Connected Nation is that, that there's been a shift in people understanding it. I don't have to explain it so much why it matters to connect people. Is, is that what you're finding by... Uh, amongst elected officials that that's so there's suddenly a clear understanding of this of digital inequity yes mm-hmm. yeah i mean i think with the with the digital equity coalition and um the other co-founders in the houses we're, we're also educators all of us have been in the classroom before um and so we understand the impact of digital access to our students um and because we've become more and more dependent on just being online, all of our government officials, I feel across the layers, have been seeing the impact at another level. It's just a matter of who, who wants to act, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or who, who is invested enough. Um, and thankfully, we've seen a good amount of investment because how, how could you argue with someone and say, uh, you know, you're, you're in a low-income neighborhood. And so unfortunately, we, we can't support you. Um, so definitely a lot more, a lot more investment. That's good to see. I, I would say I, I think another important point you, you made there was that the seat at the at the table for all the kids and before the, the pandemic hit, there was an estimated 16.9 million kids in the homework gap. It was called the homework gap, as in they had access at school, but not at home. And so this recognition is a, is very important. And um, I think, Evan, you, you really realized that and you were working towards that in the schools and now have shifted. Can you discuss the recent effort your organization launched in Oakland? 
Yeah, so uh, as part of our launch of our new mission, we announced a partnership with Oakland to close 90% uh, of the digital divide in, in, in Oakland. Um, we uh, were focused on the communities in Oakland that um, have most of the unconnected. If, if you look at um, you know West Oakland as, as, or East Oakland in the Oakland Flats and parts of West Oakland, um, on average, 38% of the, the households there don't have internet access at home. And um, you know that's just unbelievable when you're talking about you know a city that's part of the the, the tech hub of the Bay Area, uh, and so our partnership with with the mayor and the city and uh, the, the ISPs there and everyone else is really about closing that digital divide. And and there's two primary initiatives that that we're doing there. The first is, um, as I mentioned before, we're we're installing free Wi-Fi networks in uh, apartment buildings where a lot of these residents live. Um, it turns out that the way technology has improved when it comes to Wi-Fi, um, you no longer have to actually put an access point into every apartment. You can simply run access points down the hallway uh, and in the common areas, and then anybody sitting in their apartment can actually get access at, at really high speeds. And so uh, we've done that in eight buildings already in Oakland, and our plan is to expand that to, to well over 100. Uh, over the coming uh, years. Um, the second thing we're doing is uh, we're focusing on helping the residents of Oakland who don't live in those apartment buildings um, get signed up for the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, that program is a $30 per month benefit for eligible households, and it's a credit that they get for their, their broadband plan. And all of the major providers in Oakland have plans that you can get for $30 a month or less um, to get online. And so if you're not in one of those apartment buildings, what we're trying to do is, is reach out to you, get you signed up uh, for the Affordable Connectivity Program benefit, and which, which is slated to last for four to five years, um, as well as uh, then get you signed up with an ISP so that you then have wired internet service at home. Because as Lorna said, you know, hotspots and things like that, those, those were the, the stopgap solution that we, have, we all have to do to get people online as quickly as possible. But I think what schools and others are, are learning is, you know, a hotspot's pretty good, but if you really are going to be doing a lot of um, internet-based work or schooling or healthcare or anything else, you really need a wired connection at, at the highest possible speed you, you can afford. So um, those are the two major programs. Um, and one of the things we're really excited about as part of that is we're working with um, a collect with the Green Lining Institute in, in Oakland and a collection uh, of about 10 to 15 community-based organizations on getting the word out to, to their um, community members about the Affordable Connectivity Program, helping them get signed up for it, uh, and, and, and then helping them get signed up for internet service. And we're looking forward to, in January, we're gonna actually be doing uh, a big event with one of them, uh, Homies Empowerment, to, to sort of do live signups at their, uh, their Freedom Store when, when, when their, their community is there, um, you know, interacting with them. So uh, we're excited about the Oakland Initiative. Um, we think it's gonna be a showcase for the rest of the nation. And, um, but we're not gonna wait till we're done in Oakland. Uh, we're gonna be rolling out to lots and lots of cities across the nation. Um, Lorena, on your side, you, you spoke a little bit about San Jose area and what you're doing. Can you expand a little bit on uh, those short-term and long-term efforts? Yes. So uh, I, like I mentioned, the Digital Equity Coalition is really focused on long-term infrastructure where we're beyond the short-term. It's It costs too much money. It's not uh, reliable as long-term infrastructure in our families just simply like this is a basic human right, like power, electricity, water. Our families should have access to this regardless of what zip code they live in. And so at Eastside specifically, um, you, you mentioned the homework gap. Our superintendent six years ago said there is this homework gap for high school students. They have access to the internet when they're at school, but then they go home and they no longer can, they can't reach the internet. They can't do their research. Um, and so we started this project with the city of San Jose, um, where we were, we were said to connect our highest needs communities um, with uh, permanent infrastructure. In six years, one school community was done, the James Lick community. And I don't know if you're familiar with East Side of San Jose, but East Side of San Jose, out of 10 districts, we cover about half of them. It is huge, 80,000 students. Um, 
70% of our district is about over 300,000 people. And with this initiative, since the pandemic hit has been a big focus of the Digital Equity Coalition. And we've worked a lot more closely with the city of San Jose. And in this past year, we've been able to wire two more school communities. Um, and so by the end of next year, we would have wired about 70% of our district, which is highest needs neighborhoods in the district, um, over 300,000 families. And so it's aligned for our East Side students and also for our community members as well, parents, um, the tios, the tias, the abuelas, anybody that needs access for whether it's working from home or telemedicine, um, you name it. And so that has been a big pride of ours here at Eastside. And it's something that we hope to replicate um, as an organization, as a group, um, not just within the East Side, but expands throughout the county and the state. And um, I, I do want to call attention to a little bit that um, uh you pronounce things much better than I do. I say San Jose, you say, you say it correctly. I'm trying. And the reason I bring that up is because I have a very good friend. I grew up in San Antonio and it's a very high Latina, Latino population. And I have a very good friend who's a teacher. And um, some of the challenges there when it comes to language, when it comes to, um, as you said, the abuelo, the uh, grandmother, right? Do I have that right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, teaching him or her or the grandmother or the grandma or the grandpa how to use the technology as well so they can help their child with their, if they're a young child, are there um, uh, other people in there? Talk a little bit about the language side of it. Is there a challenge with make, with helping everybody get online? Yes. Digital literacy is huge. You know, when, when we closed down, when we shut down our schools and we went into distance learning, it was a shock for everybody. But um, I remember it was really important for me to stay in touch with our families, with our parent liaisons. And um, I, I graduated from, from the high school district where I'm a trustee now. And so the high school where I went to very, very closely in touch and I used to talk to the parent liaison, she, she would tell me, Lorena, I've been, I've been on the phone with this mother trying to turn on this hotspot for two weeks every morning before she goes to work. She calls me and she says, how do I log my child on? I haven't been able to do it. And by the end of week two, she was over it. She's like, I can't do this. I need to work. She'd spend hours trying to figure out how to turn on a hotspot, right? And then when, when you think about all the other complexities, like how, how to use PowerPoint, how to log on to different things. So that is very top of mind for us, but not just like the devices, whether it's long-term or, or short-term um, infrastructure or solutions, but is how do we bring our students and our families, you know, up to date with how to use this, you know, digital, everything digital, right? Um, when I was in high school, this wasn't a topic of, of conversation, right? It was like, oh yeah, you have a computer, get a computer when you go to college. Uh, but now it's it's what's top of mind, top of heart. So yeah, definitely digital li literacy and the language barrier, making sure that it's accessible to our families. Um, predominant language here in the East Side is Spanish, majority are Latino, close to 50%. Um, following that is our Asian population, our Vietnamese. Um, and so we're very, very thoughtful of making sure that we're inclusive of those two populations and every, all the other languages so that we not only make sure that we have the devices, the internet, but that we ensure that our families have the skill to access it so that they too can support their students because they want to, they want to be involved in their child's education. It's just a matter of having the skill and having that confidence in, in the adults, right? The system right behind them to make sure that they're part of this experience as well. Great, great answer. Um, Evan, uh, to you, uh, thinking on this when a lot of schools gave out hotspots and, you know, there was this temporary fix that, because uh, uh, schools were scrambling. Um, are you finding that you, that you're really having to look for long-term solutions because of that? Because a lot of schools are going to be asking for that back or their laptop back or their, uh, are, are you guys exploring that issue as well? 
Well, what we're seeing uh, happen in the K-12 community is that schools that maybe use CARES Act funding or maybe used emergency connectivity program from the FCC funding uh, to, to fund those you know, hotspots and laptops and whatnot um, are now actually looking towards the affordable connectivity program. They're saying, okay, this is, this is a program that's gonna be around for a while. It's $30 a month. We can get our families signed up onto it. And so what they're looking for at this point is help in terms of doing two things. One, figuring out which of their families still aren't connected or are only connected with a hotspot that, yeah, they're gonna have to turn off the, the service for because as Lorena was saying, it, you know, it's too expensive, right? Um, and two, uh, so figuring out how to identify who those people are. And then two, looking for help to figure out how do we get people actually aware of and signed up for the affordable connectivity program. Um, schools now understand that, you know, it is part of their responsibility to make sure that every student, and I love the way uh, Lorena said this, has a seat in the classroom, you know, mm -hmm. whether, uh, whether they're at home or at school. And if they're at school, every student needs to be on a level playing field in terms of their ability to, to do their homework. And if you're a, a kid without internet at home, you are not on a lay level playing field with your peers that have it uh, in any way, shape or form. And it's just, you know, become painfully obvious. And, and as a result, schools now, whereas before the pandemic, the predominant uh, attitude of schools when it came to home internet was like, that's not my problem. That's the family's choice. They, if it's a priority for them, they'll figure it out. Now schools don't feel that way at all. Uh, you know, now schools are like, we need to help our families uh, get online. But you know, they are looking to state and federal government to provide the funding to make that happen because school districts, you know, they they don't necessarily have the funding on an ongoing basis to be able to do this. Um, I, I'm getting a couple of comments and questions, and they're not really to deal with schools; they're to deal with seniors. Um, one person says, even here in Silicon Valley. Many elderly people do not have the hardware or know how to use it if they have it. Another person says, I'm a senior in Fremont. I have access. I, I'm trying to give it some excitement. I have a senior in Fremont. I have access, but I dearly wish I have adequate, I have I, I had adequate knowledge of the internet besides basic email. So as we work to help kids and 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 that uh, I would say that it really it resonates, it goes out and helps others. Am I correct in that? It's not just a, a kid or thing that we're doing here. It's that we're also helping those, their parents, their, their, their um, grandparents, their, their elderly neighbor, there's ways also to reach them with uh, Lorena or Evan, which one of you would like to take that? 100%. Yeah. 100%. This is, you know, why, when I started the conversation, I said like, uh, now the pandemic has really shined light on the issue and how dependent we've become on internet. It is not just for education purposes, right? Not just so that our students have a desk in the classroom. It's so our, our seniors, our parents like, can go to work, right? There are a lot of people that work from home now, right? But they need that internet access. There are a lot of our highest needs families, regardless of whether you're a senior or you're a baby, right? We need to make sure that we have resources for them, that people can find jobs, that they can have access to healthcare. And this is why it's important that there's collaboration across multiple layers of government. This should not just be put on the schools. All of a sudden it's just like, oh, well, kids have to go home. Everything shut down. Everybody felt that. I have two kids in elementary, a seven and an eight year old. Let me tell you, <laughs> working full time with two elementary kids at home because I was like, I, I need to stay in my, my area. I was scared right, of, of catching COVID. Um, similarly to I'm sure how many families felt and that takes a toll on people. And so I was very reliant. But as an adult, you know, in, in, in my professional career, I can't just rely on school districts to solve this for me. And it's also not right, right? Our school districts are way underfunded. We don't have enough money to, you know, support our students. And so this is why I'm really grateful that the federal government has started to step up, that the state has started to step up, that the, the city of San Jose is saying like, yes, 
in six years, maybe we only um, wired one school community, but in a year we wired two and we're committed to five others and within a year time span, right? And like today, the um, County of Supervisors for Santa Clara County is hearing um, a proposal to give more access to our whole county, right? And I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. Collaboration across layers of government that's where the power is. That's where the opportunity is. If we were to do this for um, education period, my goodness, <laughs> our world would be a different place. <laughs> but you know what? what? One step at a time, one thing at a time. We have to see our wins and hopefully that'll <laughs> motivate more of us to continue this ongoing collaboration beyond the pandemic. The other thing um, just to, to note on this point uh, is that one of the things buried in that 1.1 trillion dollar infrastructure act is um, something called the Digital Equity Act, and the Digital Equity Act is going to provide 2.75 billion dollars. It's the most money the federal government has al ever al allocated towards digital equity, and that includes things like helping people adopt the affordable connectivity program so they can get online. But it also includes things like digital literacy education, um, for, and not just for schools, we're talking about for anybody. And so uh, the federal government, you know, not only have they continued to invest in building infrastructure to places where there isn't any, and now subsidizing broadband for people who can't afford it, but they're also investing in, you know, digital literacy and the other things that you need to be able to use the internet effectively. Well, as as we're starting to have these conversations and uh, lawmakers are putting funding toward it, which really says what they what they care about. I mean, where the money is, where it hits the road, it's where you know that they're really going to try to do something at least. Uh, what are some of the barriers that you both see are still in the way? Evan, since you're, why don't you start it out? Just what are some things that we really just need to remove, get rid of, get out of the way so that this can take place? Yeah. So there's a, a pretty long list, unfortunately. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it starts with good data. Um, you know, we need good data about where is their infrastructure and who's connected. And the, the Federal Communications Commission is taking um, some uh, really good steps in terms of that first thing. And you know, we, in partnership with ISPs, are starting to take steps in terms of the second thing, like who is and isn't connected. So that's the first thing. Because once we know where there's not infrastructure and we know who isn't connected, we can be really targeted in the work of trying to get people online. The second barrier is frankly one of awareness. Uh, you know, There's a recent survey that came out that only 25% of eligible households actually even knew about the emergency broadband benefit, which is becoming the affordable connectivity program. Yet when they heard about it, two thirds of them wanted to sign up. And so we have this big adoption problem historically with federal broadband subsidies, less than 20% of eligible households actually sign up. So getting awareness out is a big part of the, of, of the problem. The third thing is trust. And uh, Lorena was talking about this earlier, but you know, a lot of the families that um, are eligible for these broadband subsidies, they don't have a lot of trust in the government. They're, you know, they're worried about, will their data get used for things that they don't want their data used for? Will, will they, are they, they're worried, will it cause problems for them in the rest of their life? And so we need trusted institutions like school districts and housing authorities and community-based organizations and, and others to be the ones who are doing the outreach to these families and to these households. And then the last thing in terms of barriers is actually getting people signed up. Um, it won't surprise you that it's pretty mm -hmm. complicated to, you know, sign up for this uh, broadband benefits from the um, from the federal government, including the fact that you kind of mostly need to sign up online. We're talking about people who don't have internet access. So, um, so helping people through this complex process, helping them sign up even when they don't have an internet connection is the other real barrier. And so if we get the data that we need, if we overcome the awareness, the trust and the enrollment barriers, I think we can really close this. And the great news is there's great examples across the nation of where we're doing just that. And so it's really about collecting those examples, learning from them, creating the best practices and then supporting communities and cities around the country in rolling these things out. 
And Lorena, what would you say are some of the biggest barriers, especially in the San Jose area where you're, where you're trying to work right now with the Digital Equity Coalition? Two things come to mind. That infrastructure, long-term infrastructure is the opportunity, right? I, I go back to this as a basic, right? A lot of our families are having to choose between paying for food or internet. That's not okay. That's very problematic. And so long-term infrastructure is very top of mind that is accessible to all of our highest needs families. Um, <clears throat> another thing is there's, we've been talking about this, there's a lot of energy um, around digital access right now. But once things settle down, will that remain? Because it's going to take some time to get the work done, especially mm -hmm. if we're talking about long-term infrastructure. You know, I talked about with ESI finishing within a year or two, 70% of the district, that's only 300,000 people, right? Um, but will, will this be forgotten, right? Um, will we forget that there is digital redlining across our highest needs communities? Um, and so that, that, is, that is a fear of mine, just making sure that we stay focused, that there's ongoing momentum, because this, this can really change lives. Uh, I do have one question. What, what do you mean when you say that part of the community is wired? Do you mean public Wi-Fi or something else? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm referring specifically to Eastside, right? The project that we have in collaboration with uh, the city of San Jose, Eastside Access. Um, and so we have um, infrastructure uh, in three of the seven communities, um, that um, we are set to to wire to, to get that permanent Wi-Fi access um, to our not just students but our families, right? And so it's just about staying staying on top of that, um, but not just for for the east side for the district that I serve in, um, but for the state as a whole, right? That's that's our our big focus as the Digital Equity Coalition, because you'd be surprised, right? Not that much time has, has passed and still like, yes, there's energy in certain places, but some lawmakers have started to forget. They said, oh, I gave my 3 million or I put in my piece mm -hmm. of the pie or I engaged in this this time, right? Now moving on to the next thing and no, it's, it's not over. It's not over. So you really see this and I would agree. Um, I think anybody at Connected Nation would agree with you that it's not a one, two year thing. Mm -hmm. We need to think 10 years, future proofing, that type of thing. Yes. And maintenance too, right? It's not just like, oh, it's done. The whole community is hooked up. All you have to do is just open up your laptop and click on internet and all of a sudden you have access to internet. No, it's being able to maintain that and staying on top of all the new technology and making sure that it's still um, fast and good qualities for, for everybody, not just our students, but our families across the board. And Evan, yeah, oh, sorry, I was just going to add one thing. Lorraine is really right. Like, we are in a moment where everyone is focused on this. Mm -hmm. We've gotten a whole bunch of resources. There's a lot of momentum and we're going to get a lot done, but we absolutely need to keep people focused on this. And, you know, when we went from 10% of schools to 99.6% of schools being connected to the internet with high-speed broadband, one of the ways we did it was by issuing a report Every, uh, every year on the progress that was being made. And we use that report to, you know, frankly, both get policymakers credit for the, the work that they were doing to, to connect things, because we all know policymakers love to get credit for <laughs> progress, uh, but also to hold people accountable. And the com combination of those two things made it possible for, you know, us to keep that momentum in the school arena going for seven years. And, and frankly, Jessica, as you know, uh, Connected Nation is now part of the effort to, that's taken over keeping that accountability and momentum going. And uh, that's something that we're going to need to do when it comes to home internet access as well. Mm -hmm. And Evan's referring to Connect K through 12, which is uh, if, if you're a school district leader or state leader, definitely go check it out. You can find your own district data right there in just seconds. Just put, put your data, put your the school district in or state in, you can find that. But uh, that would also point to, because this next stage that Connected Nation is handling, it has to deal with more bandwidth, but, you know, more technology in the schools, digital learning every day. Um, how do we future-proof 
these things. I, I mean, we're spending billions of dollars right now. That's we're talking, that's almost unfathomable, that number billion, a billion. And we're talking 400, that 400 billion in broadband related in different ways, um, type of funding. Um, how do we make, make this last? What, in your opinion, how do we make it last? Other than I get accountability and those types of things, but when you're building out or when you're um, building these programs or looking at this, we can't just think about today because even, even today, a child who's in, in school, they're going to have a job that none of us ever imagined it would ever exist. And they're going to have demands on technology that none of us could even fathom today that are going to become second nature in 10, 15 years. So how do you even begin to tackle that kind of um, future? Yeah, well, I mean, it all starts with fiber, right? We, we need to get fiber into the cores of our networks and pushed out as far into our neighborhoods as, as, as we possibly can. Um, you know, getting fiber to every single uh, apartment or house in the nation is a, an expense that's even beyond what the government is funding right now. But if we can get fiber into every neighborhood, that's going to give this, us the ability to keep upgrading the speeds and what's capable. Look, our long-term goal should be to ultimately get fiber everywhere we can get it. But practically speaking, it's not clear that that's really, you know, affordable for us at, at this point in time. And, and that's probably like a 30 or 40 year goal for us. Um, but what we can do is we can make sure, and this is something that the state of California is really taking a leadership role on. It, it, it's really interesting. Um, so California, uh, passed a bill uh, earlier this year, I think it was earlier this year, uh, might've been last year, um, that's allocating $6 billion to, to, to expanding broadband in the state of California. Three billion of that is what they are investing in what's called middle mile infrastructure. So that is what I was just talking about, getting the fiber into every neighborhood in California. And what's interesting is if you look at the federal broadband bill, the infrastructure bill that just passed, I think they're also investing $3 billion to push middle mile fiber mm -hmm. into neighborhoods around and, and communities around the country. So California is spending $3 billion and the federal government is spending $3 billion for 50 states, right? So California is really a leader in this work. Um, it's being led by an organization called Scenic. Uh, which has run historically California's um, uh, education network that, that brings broadband to every uh, public school in, in, in the state, as well as higher ed institutions and, and other research institutions. Um, they're doing a fabulous job. And, and just the last a couple of weeks ago, uh, the governor announced sort of the first phase of the rollout of that, um, which we were excited to see includes Oakland. Uh, and pushing fiber into parts of Oakland where we're, we're doing some of our projects around apartment Wi-Fi. So, um, but they're going to get it into places that there has never been fiber before uh, in this state and, and in this country. So that's really the, the key to it all. And it's just, we're just going to have to keep chipping away and chipping away and chipping away. But um, there's a lot we can do as long as we get it into the neighborhood. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Evan. Evan, when you say fiber, I'm like, oh my goodness, how many times have I had conversations around fiber to get some of our communities <laughs> wired because it just isn't there. Um, but the, the, the thing I would add is orientation, like a people piece, right? There's like the work, right? That needs to happen, the logistics, the in the, in the ways in the actual doing it. But then there's the, the adults, the legislators, the people continuing that work, right? And when I think about the difference between six years ago, when one school community was wired over across, you know, across six year span versus two, um, two additional ones and a commitment to four additional ones, a total of seven within a year and a half is people and being able to collaborate across layers of government, being able to come to the table, helping each other see their role beyond their term, 
right? And so that's something that we as a digital equity coalition, I think I've been doing a, a decent job at and continue to strive to get better at every day, right? I mean, our work started with writing letters to the board of supervisors at the county and to the city saying enough is enough. And they said, oh yeah, enough is enough. Let's have a meeting. And we met <laughs> and we've been meeting since, right? And so how do we build that out within the structures that exist, right? So that that could continue being a part of the conversation. Right now to Eastside is just a high school district, right? 22,000 students, but we have seven feeder districts totaling in 80,000 students that are served across the east side. And so we've been working these past few years investing our feeder districts too, because when we think about internet access, it's not just internet access for the high school students, it's internet access for our elementary school students, for our middle school students, for our parents, for our abuelos, our tios, our tias, right? Like I mentioned earlier, um, but it's the adult the leaders having that conversation and say, saying, what is my role here, right? And that's part of also that maintenance part and saying, okay, so Eastside, you, you're working very closely with the city of San Jose to roll this out, to get it set up. I am committed to supporting with, with the maintenance, for example, right? And so those are the conversations that we're starting, starting to have. And so whether it's superintendents, whether it's board members, city council, assembly members, it's all of us speaking the same language. Let, let's touch on that human side a little bit more. And uh, I'd like to, both of you guys to answer this. It's obviously, this is, um, it has to be somewhat of a labor of love, somewhat personal, share why it means so much to you, Lorena. And then Evan, I'd like you to answer the same question. Why, why this work means so much to me. Mm-hmm. My gosh, you want me to tell you my whole life story. <laughs> <laughs> we got 15 minutes. <laughs> Evan gets to you. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I like I mentioned, I, I grew up in the East side of San Jose. I, I went to the schools that we serve um, at East side. My dad's a gardener. My mom worked at a laundromat, very poor, migrants from Mexico. I was that kid that would drive by San Jose State and say, as a five-year-old, I will never go there because I'm not smart enough. My parents, second grade education. And so that is not for me. And so there are some deep entrenched systemic inequities that lead a five-year-old to think that way, right? And and as an educator in the classroom, I would see it too. As a principal leading a school, I would see that too. And that's why I'm a school board member because when when I was at the school system, I'm like, who sets these policies? Why are the things the way they are, right? And, And so that's why I ran for school board to have an impact on policy because the gaps that exist that affect our, the majority of the population, our Latino students, our black and brown students, where the highest in disproportionality when it comes to um, academic gaps and the referrals, highest referrals, highest suspensions, expulsions, and that's not okay, right? Um, we're talking about giving access to, you know, Wi-Fi to all of our students. Um, and they're, they're the same students that have the biggest gaps, right? And we're in Silicon Valley. This is not only not okay, but this is embarrassing, right? Um, And so we need to do right by our children, by our community, by our future. Because if we don't, then what's left of us? What, what, (laughs) What should we expect, right? I am the believer that, you know, not only experience that the education inequities as a student growing up in the East Side, but I truly believe as an educator at heart and one that continues to work in the education system, um, that the biggest social justice issue of our lifetime is education inequity. And until we get that right, <laughs> oh my goodness, Let, let's, let's, not, let's not go there, right? <laughs> but there is opportunity for us to work across the layers because these of, of government, because these inequities are, are not started necessarily in the classroom. They're multi-layered and there is a role for multiple players to be a part of the solution. And so that's why I think this is important because this is part of finding the solution to that big problem. So that's my big why. What's your big why, Evan? My why is opportunity. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, um, 
I grew up as a son of two educators and they drilled into me how important education was and education has opened every door in my life uh, and, and given me opportunities that I never thought I would have had uh, as a kid. And, and so for me, what I was, what got me into this work originally was this vision that, you know, internet could help level the playing field in education. I mean, it's what Lorraine is talking about, right? I mean, if you have internet in every classroom, in America, it means that every classroom in America has access to education, the, the same kinds of educational opportunities. If you're a, a kid in a rural high school that doesn't have an AP physics class, now you can take an AP physics class. If you're a, a kid in the city of San, San Francisco who's interested in you know, art and the wonders that you can see in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, you can now visit that Metropolitan Museum in New York. And, and the list just goes sort of on and on and on about the wonders, wonderful things that we can do with technology um, in education. And so for me, getting into this work originally in education was about, just as we're gonna say, leveling the playing field of educational opportunity and therefore leveling the playing field for opportunity generally in America. And now our transition to doing that at home for, for people at home, it's the same thing. It's about making sure everyone has the same access, the same opportunities uh, in every part of their life, whether it's education, being able to work remotely, being able to access telehealth, being able to get the job training that will help you make a better life for your family by getting you that next job, you know, being able to access the social safety net services and the list just goes on and on and on. So for me, this work is about expanding opportunity for every American, but particularly for the Americans who, you know, have historically been at an incredible disadvantage uh, in, in, in our nation. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so I, I have a, just a couple more questions for you each. Uh, let's start with looking into 2022. Obviously, obvious, all this opportunity that we've talked about with, with funding and understanding. What do you see as your top priorities moving into 2022? Lorena, why don't you start for us? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll repeat what I've said before. It's that long-term infrastructure. It's that collaboration across governments. It's it's getting those bills at legislature, a legislation passed that supports this work, right? Again, because our families should not have to pick between paying for internet, high quality, fast internet um, over food, right? And so that is very top of mind, making sure that we're able to work across layers of government and are invested and understand and are aligned that basic internet, high quality, fast internet, that's what I mean by basic, <laughs> like, let me be clear, um, is a human right. So. And for you, Evan? Yeah, the, unfortunately, my list is really long. There's a lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, you know, the key priorities for us coming up in 2022 are number one, the implementation of the infrastructure bill. You know, there's, set, there's $65 billion there plus another $20 billion from previous acts that have happened from under both President Biden and Trump. Um, and next year is the year where that money is going to start getting distributed. And so we need to make sure that the rules are set up in a way where it benefits all Americans. Um, and, and where every community has a shot at improving itself because of the funding that Congress has put together. So that's priority number one. Priority number two um, is expanding our partnerships with internet service providers. As I mentioned, we're working with over 130 of them covering over 90% of the households in the country right now to get that data about who is, is and isn't connected and expanding those partnerships and um, you know, really leveraging what, what the ISPs are bringing to the table on this issue and trying to help communities upgrade. And then the third big priority for us is um, really figuring out the exact playbooks um, that cities and school districts and housing authorities and community health centers and other trusted institutions can use to both deploy Wi-Fi networks into low-income apartment buildings so people have free Wi-Fi, um, and also to get people signed up for the Affordable Connectivity Program. In 2022, we hope to have those, those strategies really nailed down and starting to expand them around the country. And then the last thing is really engaging mayors. Um, you know, unlike uh, our work in schools, which primarily focused around governors and, and superintendents, 
this work, the work of connecting people at home, that's really about mayors, um, you know, and the communities in general, but mayors have a leadership role to play. And, you know, we're gonna spend 2022 engaging with as many mayors as possible and, and giving them the roadmap for how they can do the kinds of stuff that Lorraine is doing already uh, in San Jose and, and Santa Clara County. So that, as I said, long list of priorities, but we gotta get them all done. Yeah, that is, you do have a long list. You've got your work cut out for you. <laughs> um, I do have a question coming in. Uh, someone asked, they would be interested in hearing what parents in your communities are saying about the work that you're doing. So I, I, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, we wired three schools, so it's still fairly new. This happened this year. Um, parents are excited about it. Our students are logging on, right? There's a lot of traffic happening. Um, and I still think there's an opportunity to market it even more, right? But as of right now, our families are feeling grateful because they're not necessarily relying on this device, right? To connect. How do I turn this MiFi or this hot spot on. Um, and so there's there's quite a bit of excitement there. But again, that that digital literacy is the biggest opportunity moving forward to right there's excitement. And there's also all right, let's make sure that you really understand like, hey, you live in this neighborhood. Did you know? Oh, wait, what? Um, and so it's still it's still ongoing. Um, so we, we have work cut out for us because we're in the in the middle of let's continue making sure that there's this infrastructure built at out and there, that there's resources and like, let's make sure you know how to use it um, and you can make the most of it as well as not just, you know, a parent, but a community member as well. And Evan, are you getting any feedback yet from parents or is it still too early? Um, you know, the, the, the school communities that we've worked with, the parents are really grateful, right? But it's everything that Lorraine is saying, which is mm -hmm. there are a lot of challenges that they're facing. And, um, you know, the other thing I'll say is, you know, she's talking about her two elementary age children. We can see in her background that she's got her learning stuff up on the wall for them. Um, parents are overwhelmed. And this is just one more thing that they're struggling to deal with. And so they're definitely grateful, but they definitely need more help. All right, well, we've now reached the point in our program where there is time for only one last question for you each. Um, so I would like to ask for both. And um, perhaps Evan, you could start and Lorena, you could, you could sign us out for the day. For both, what do our viewers today most need to understand about the digital divide that they might not? Well, I think the biggest thing people need to understand about the digital divide is that actually two thirds of the digital divide is people who have access to the internet but can't afford it. That has not been the narrative historically. The narrative historically has been, it's just about building infrastructure in rural America. But you know we've been investing in that for decades now. And as a result, affordability is now the problem. And so if you know somebody who doesn't have the internet because they can't afford it, tell them about the affordable connectivity program, help them get signed up for that because that will solve their problem. So that's what I would say. Lorena? Yeah, I, I started with this and that this digital divide is not new. The pandemic has just shined light on the inequities and has made us more reliant in many ways, right, um, to, to the internet. Um, and it is clear what population, what communities are being left behind more so than others. Uh, and, you know, we, we see money coming through the state, money coming from the federal government, legislators taking action. And I think it's important for everyone to understand that we all have a role in this, right? Legislators listen to their constituents. Mm -hmm. Constituents give the ground experience. And so there is an opportunity for every single person, regardless of your title, regardless of your background, to make an impact. Call your legislator, go to a school board meeting, go to your school, call your teacher, whoever, right? Um, you don't even have to be a parent, right? Our, our community members are such key roles in moving work forward. And if we really want to continue this work, 
beyond the next year or two, we're going to really depend on everybody putting in their part. Um, like we say in Spanish, cada quien pone su granito de arena, their little, their little grade, right? But it, it makes an impact. And so I really hope that everyone takes that seriously um, and puts in their part because this is part of what leads to our education inequities, right? And an opportunity to do right, not just by our children, but by our community as a whole. Well, uh- Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I would, I would put, I would like to put a little finer point on what you both said and say that um, it's wonderful what both of your organizations are doing, um, really tackling this issue. You're going to help. You could help thousands, if not millions, of people. And it, we are in a moment of time where things can truly change. So, how would if 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 someone wants to get involved with either one of your organizations or help? or follow along, how would they do so? Lorena, do you, do you want to let, let us know? And then Evan, you could, you could uh, tell us as well. Yep. They could, for the Digital Equity Coalition, they can just literally look us up, digitalequitycoalition.org. Um, and there is a button where you can click, get involved. And we have a little general button and there's like many other ways. That's one way to get a hold of us. You could also always email me if you're interested in Eastside Access specifically and the project that we're rolling up in collaboration with the city of San Jose. My email is chavezl at esuhsd.org. And Evan, how would we follow along with Education Superhighway? Well, our, our website is educationsuperhighway.org and you can follow us on the various, you know, Twitter and Facebook and everything else at Ed Superhighway. So I uh, hope people follow along. We, uh, we need, as Lorena said, we need everybody's hands in to make this happen for our, our communities. I would add bravo and hear here to that. So I want to thank Evan Marwell and Lorena Chavez for joining us today to discuss this very important issue that affects so many people. And again, a thank you to AT&T for its support of today's program. This program and others like it will soon be found on the Commonwealth Club's website at www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm Jessica Denson of Connected Nation, and this Commonwealth Club program is now adjourned.